The Christadelphians present This is Your Bible, a program dedicated to the study of your Bible to learn about the wonderful future that God has planned for this earth. Join us now as we open up the Bible and reason together around God's Word. Welcome to another episode of This Is Your Bible. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what is the meaning of life? Or what am I doing here? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? All these questions that man has always asked himself throughout centuries can all be answered if we know what God's purpose is with the earth. So we're going to look at that and find out what God's purpose is with the earth to have the answers to all these other questions. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. I don't know what your idea of paradise is. We all have our own views on the subject, but I think that most would agree the scenes we are looking at could be described as a touch of paradise. The Creator made this earth a paradise originally, and then mankind spoiled it by trying to do things his own self-centered way. Mankind has ever since tried to create his own paradise, one in which man is glorified and the Creator is forgotten. All around us we can see grim reminders of the remoteness of paradise, reminders that man without God cannot bridge that distance to the true paradise. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, we're told that the original creation made by God was very good. We are also told that throughout the Bible, that the world will be very good again when Jesus Christ returns to establish the kingdom of God on the earth. In Psalm 72 it says, He, Christ, shall deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also on him that has no helper. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence. In Isaiah 35, the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. And in the book of Revelation there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. Sounds good, doesn't it? This is what the Bible has to say about the good things to come. You can learn more about the message of the Bible and your part in God's plan by signing up for our free online Bible courses at thisisyourbible.com. Just click on the Learn More tab and register for Exploring the Bible. Yes, the Bible does tell us that there will be a true paradise here, again, on earth, soon. Will you be ready? Welcome back to This is your Bible. At the opening of our program, we'd asked some pretty profound questions about life in general. What is life all about? What is the meaning of life? How do we know what we're supposed to be doing in this life that we've been given? Well, we said that we would answer those questions, all of them, by knowing what God's purpose with the earth was all about. And with us today to look at this answer as to what God's purpose is, is Jonathan Bowen. Nice to have you with us, Jonathan. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming. You know, I know you came all the way from Canada, but you're a major Bible student, and you've been spending a lot of time in the Word. And I suppose you have some kind of an answer to this question of what God's purpose with the world and with us is all about? Well, the answer is right in the book itself. It's interesting, especially when we look at creation, and we look at the world, and we look at the universe, and we sometimes stand there, and you think of the words of the psalmist when he stood there, and he looks up, and he says, when I consider the works, the works of the Lord, the works of his hand, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you consider him? And it sort of begins that question of why are we here? Why has God created this? Why is he interested in us small, puny little creatures on planet Earth? Well, if you come to Isaiah 45, he tells us why he began this whole process of creation. Verse 18, he tells us there, Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So he had a purpose in making the earth and in his purpose of making the earth, he planned from the beginning that he would inhabit it with, what, with people or animals or what? 
Well, that answer is given to us over in Numbers chapter 14. Okay. It's interesting as we look at that, what he says in Isaiah, that he created it to be inhabited, mm -hmm. is that, you know, there's ideas sometimes that the earth ultimately would be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Well, he said, well, I didn't create it in vain. It's not an empty thing that I did, a waste of time. Mm -hmm. I created it to be inhabited. And he tells us in Numbers 14 and verse 21, inhabited with what? He says, as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. So that's Numbers 14, verse 21. And it comes in the context of Moses in the wilderness, and there's Joshua, and the children of Israel have sinned, and God's very wrath, wrathful with them, and he's angry with them. And Moses talks to God and, and basically says, you know, don't destroy them. And God says, no, I'm not going to destroy them. But he says, understand this. My purpose will be fulfilled. The earth is going to be filled with the glory of the Lord. So in the midst of failure, when I feel like I can do nothing right, I've done all kinds of things that are wrong, God says, just wait, I have a plan. And my plan will not be thwarted by somebody else's failure. He's going to carry this out. It's going to happen. That's it's, correct. Okay? That's so, correct. So within the midst of this, you know, this failure, and he's going to fill the earth with his glory, I, I'm still not quite sure what that purpose is. What's this all about with his glory? Well, his glory, if we go over to Habakkuk chapter 2, it's almost a quote for what we have in, in Numbers. And Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets, and it's a prophecy, again, pointing forward to the future, and it, it's telling us about what is coming upon the earth. And um, he adds an element to this. He repeats the same phrase, but he adds the element in chapter 2 and verse 14. He says, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So you notice what's different between those two verses? Well, I asked you about, well, what was the glory? And he says, not only is he going to fill the earth with his glory, but the difference is the word knowledge. So I'm supposed to have a knowledge of this glory? That's correct. Well, you think of, you know, filling the earth with glory. Sometimes people think, well, is that like, you know, creation? Is that like the flowers and the birds and the trees? And it's true. Uh, Psalm 19, verse 1 tells us that, you know, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord, the, mm -hmm. the wonder of the, of the so, Lord in that sense. So that's the answer you're saying? Not entirely, because here it's he's filling it with the knowledge of his glory. Okay. Now, you have to say, okay, what does that word knowledge mean? Okay. It's the Hebrew word yada, which goes right the way back to Genesis. And when the Garden of Eden was first established, Adam and Eve were there, and it speaks this of several situations, an intimate relationship between a husband and a wife. It says, Adam knew his wife and she conceived. So this word here doesn't mean a passing knowledge. It means an intimate knowledge. So we have to have an intimate knowledge of the Lord. So it's not just simply, oh, I've heard of that, or I think I read it once, or I read somewhere about this. I have to have more of an experiential knowledge of what this is really all about That's in right. order for me to be part of this? That's right. It's no different than, you know, when somebody has a spouse. Uh, you can say, well, I know that person, but I can, I can know exactly what my wife is thinking. Just by the look on her face, I know what she thinks. If I've done something wrong, <laughs> I'm going to know that right away. Now, I know that because I know this person very well. Mm -hmm. And so the same thing is true. It, what is God is saying here is that he wants people to have an intimate knowledge an experiential knowledge, as you said, they, they know this very well, of His glory. Okay, but we got to go. Where are we going to get the answer to what this glory is all about? I understand I have to have a knowledge, an experiential knowledge, an intimate knowledge, but what's the glory about? Well, let's go back over to Exodus, because Exodus, uh, Moses pretty well asks the same question. Moses has been asked by God to go and uh, to talk to his people and Moses is a little bit apprehensive, and he wants to kind of know uh, what he can say to his people about who God really is. So we come to Exodus chapter 34, or chapter 33 really is where Moses begins. He says in verse 13, he says, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, he says, show me now thy ways that I may know thee. Well, there's that word yada again, uh -huh. to know very intimately, to know very well, to be fully familiar with. Well, come down to verse 18. He rephrases the question. He says, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. So here, Moses is asked more or less what you have. Well, show me. What is this glory? What is it all about? But he also calls it his ways, which is interesting. So the ways in the glory are synonymous. 
Now, if you think of somebody's ways, if I was to say, you know, does somebody know Steve? And they would say, yes, I know Steve. Steve's a great guy. This is the kind of person Steve is. They would probably tell me a little bit about your character. Well, that's the same thing here. And God, over in Exodus 34, sends his angel to Moses. And the angel of the Lord, in verse 5, it says that he descends in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed unto him the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, but will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So this character that you're talking about, which is listed in all of these characteristics of being gracious, forgiving or merciful and long-suffering, you're saying that that's God's character and that's what he's going to fill the earth with? That's right. It's almost like his resume. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were to apply for a job and I was to say, all right, Steve has applied for a job, you say, well, who is Steve? You know, well, I would give you a resume, or you give me a resume, right. and say, okay, this is who I am, this is what I've done, this is what I'm all about. Well, this is what God is doing here with Moses, is he's giving a, a catalog or a resume of who he really is, and he proclaims this name to him. So, you think if somebody has a good name, mm -hmm. that stands for their character. Well, the same thing here, this is the name of God, it's his character that's outlined, and all those characteristics is who God is. And we see them in, in different stories in the Bible. When we go through and we read about, you know, Joshua going out into land of Is uh, to conquer the land, and they run into, you know, some terrible peoples. Well, then you have basically the judgmental side of God, perhaps. Well, then you see the story of David when he sins with Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. And there's no sacrifice he can offer under the law. Under the law, he should have been killed. Mm -hmm. But God shows him mercy. So he's a merciful God. So his character is demonstrated in the things that he does. I think it's a beautiful expression that you've brought out so well here with these passages that it is God's glory. It's not just something that is a part of him, like I have, you know, my fingers are part of me, okay? But this part of his character is really his glory. It's what makes him glorious, that he's long-suffering and merciful. I guess that he would have none to die or perish that all would come to a knowledge of the truth and that all would be saved, and that's his glory. So how is this glory and this character going to fill the earth? Well, just to summarize sort of where we're at, that's the idea, filling the earth with, an, with inhabitants, remember he created it to be inhabited, who oh, have yeah. an intimate knowledge of the character of God. That's what he wants to do. Now. That's a very critical thing that we understand. Well, you're that. talking about a, 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 a large program here. You're talking about taking people who lie, cheat, steal, don't care about anybody else but themselves, basically, which is what we have in human nature, and you're saying they've got to put all that aside and they've got to become knowledgeable of God's character and put that into practice in their life rather than all those other things that they used to do? That's right. And that God's going to fill the whole earth with people who act like he acts. Absolutely. That's his point. He wants to replicate himself on the earth by people who choose to do it. And there's the element of choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, he doesn't want robots. He could have created us all so that we autonomously do this. We have no choice. We just, you know, very statically do what exactly we're told. But what God wants is people who choose to have his character. This sounds like a core fundamental principle concerning man and his relationship with God. Absolutely. Actually, if you come over to John chapter 17, John chapter 17 is where the Lord Jesus Christ is, is explaining to his disciples the importance of really knowing all about what we've just been talking about. In John chapter 17 and verse 3, he tells them, look, he says, this is life eternal that they may know thee, the only true God, in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So your eternal life depends on having this knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Okay, now wait a minute. I know the stories about Jesus. I know that he lived and he died and that he was resurrected. And I know a little bit about the parables and things like that. So is that all I need to know? Well, I'll come over to uh, 1 of John, the, the, the letter that John wrote out to some of the ecclesias. 
in first of John, he, he sort of expounds on this a little bit more. And um, it's interesting that it's, it's not just a question of theoretically knowing who God is, mm -hmm. but that knowledge, that intimate knowledge has to extend from there into a response. In first of John chapter two, and at verse three, he says, hereby we, know, we do know that we know him. So this is the test, the litmus test. Mm -hmm. How do I know that I know God? Well, he says, if we keep his commandments. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a question of knowing, oh yeah, I have a, an intellectual knowledge. I can cite to you the characteristics of God. I can recount to you stories in the Bible, but we actually have to know his commandments. And he goes on to say in verse 17, look, he says, the world is gonna pass away and all the lusts thereof. So what you were talking about is in verse 16, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of the life, all those things that the world concerns itself with, that's all gonna end when the kingdom of God is established, ultimately gonna fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, the character of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So well, hold that thought just a second, because you're saying that all of what we see now today is going to be done away with, and only those people who have that knowledge of the glory of the Lord and have expressed that character of the Lord God will actually experience what he says, this is eternal life, this is life eternal. So those are the people that are going to be granted a place in the kingdom of God? Well, that's what it's saying right here. He says, look, the world's going to pass away yeah. and the lusts, but he that doeth the will of God, he is going to abide forever. So we have to be actively participating in that same character of God's glory in order to have a place in the kingdom. That's right. Now okay. notice back in John 17, he also put it this way. He said, listen, you've got to know who God is. This is eternal life. They may know thee, mm -hmm. the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So you have to know both. You have to know both. And if we come back to John chapter 1, we find out why. In John chapter 1, it's a, a well-known passage in the first verse. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, the word for word, if you went into the mm -hmm. Greek, mm -hmm. is actually the word logos, or logos as it really is. Mm -hmm. Now, we understand that, we use that term. We talk about logos. Mm -hmm. The company I work for has a logo. And when basically you go into somewhere, you may have that logo on your jacket, and somebody mm -hmm. reads the name of the company I work for, and they say, I mean, let's just say it was 3M was the company. 3M is here to see somebody. Well, 3M, the building didn't show up. You know what I mean? It's not like that whole thing was, was transported, but rather this is a representative of. So we understand a logo is a representative of something. Talks about purpose. And that's what the word logos means. You know, it means purpose. Yeah, a, a similar kind of an example that I think fits with this. Um, I say to my wife, hey, we're having problems with the gas, so call the gas company. So she calls the gas company, and I come home at the end of the day, and I say, did the gas company come? She said, oh, yeah, the gas company came today and fixed the problem. But did the gas company really come? No. The man who represented the gas company, he came, and exactly. he represented the whole company. So you're saying that this word logos is talking about putting on that character and representing that's right. It's the word purpose, really, mm -hmm. it, it, what we would use today. And that purpose becomes embodied in a certain individual. Turn over the page to verse 14. Yes. It tells us that the logos, the word, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld, notice, mm -hmm. his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, this is, of course, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the purpose of God made flesh in an individual. And so he says, we beheld that glory, which of course we know is the idea of character. And the wording that is at the end of the verse when it says full of grace and truth would have been personifications of his character? Well, we go back to the description that was given to us in Exodus, right? right. The Lord, the Lord God, he was merciful, he was a gracious, he was abundant in goodness and truth. Well, there you go. So it's you have two of those things right there. Beautiful. So the Lord Jesus Christ then is an individual, or probably the individual is the better way to put it, who carries the character of God. Let's just go to, um, let's go over to uh, another passage that's going to help us with this. It's in Hebrews, mm -hmm. because Hebrews kind of gives us a, an expression here that's very useful. Hebrews chapter 1, 
we have here an explanation to us of what is going on. It talks about God, verse 1, who in sundry times, in different manners, spoke in time past by, his fa by the fathers, or unto the fathers, by the prophets. So he says, look, mm -hmm. back in the Old Testament, God spoke through the prophets to the children of Israel, mm -hmm. who were their fathers, their forefathers. And he says, well, in the last days, verse 2, he hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by also whom he made the world, which is the idea of the aeons, who being the express or the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of, of his power, when he had purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So here we have and a couple of words we want to pick out here. The Lord Jesus Christ, who God has spoken to us by, who is what he calls the brightness of his glory. Mm -hmm. It's the radiance, the reflection of his glory, the express image of his person. Now, I'm a printer by trade, mm -hmm. and this word means a lot to me because it's the word character in the Greek. Mm -hmm. Now, we think of, you know, a typewriter, mm -hmm. and um, the old typewriters used yeah. to be the manual ones. You know, yeah. you really had to point <laughs> on those keys. And when you pressed one of those keys down, mm -hmm. it would lift up a little character, mm -hmm. and it would bang it onto a piece of, or through the, the uh, film, that which would be like the ribbon, mm -hmm. onto the paper, and it would leave an impression there. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what this idea is is that God has taken and expressed or left an indent of the character on the Lord Jesus Christ. Of himself. Of himself. Mm -hmm. He is an exact representative of the character, as we think of it in terms of the personality of the Father. Now, he's not the Father himself. He's the Son, mm -hmm. but he has the characteristics of the Father put right on him right from his birth. If you've seen me... You've seen the Father. Exactly. And that's what you're really talking about here in Hebrews that ties in with that verse to say that they are the same character in one. Just like I am one with my wife because we think as one together. Exactly. And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father takes us right back to your analogy of the gas man. Yes. If you saw the gas man, that was the gas company. Right. Came as the representative to do their work, to do that kind of thing. The Lord Jesus Christ came as, the, as his father's representative on earth, who basically carried those characteristics and did the will of his father. Remember what he said to Mary and Joseph? He said, wished you not that I must be about my father's business. Mm -hmm. So he was that character and purpose in an individual. And God's plan and purpose with the earth is to fill the earth with people who are also like that same image or character. That's exactly right. It's not just the Lord Jesus Christ, but he wants to see that go out further from there. Let's turn over to Peter, because it kind of mm -hmm. helps us with this. Is that first or second Peter? It would be the first of Peter. And uh, we want to come into uh, chapter 1 to begin with. Mm -hmm. He tells us here that we are to obey the truth, he says. In, in verse 22. Well, that's always good. Right? We're to basically love one another with a pure heart fervently. We're to be born from above is what the phrase there means, born again. But it really means mm -hmm. from above, meaning that we're going to be reborn, not of a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. You say, well, what, what does that exactly mean? It means that what God wants to do is recreate us through his word. The Lord Jesus Christ was the Word made flesh. Well, He wants us also to have that Word in our minds and in our hearts. And He goes on to say, basically, how do we get it? Verse 25, this is the Word which by the Gospel is preached unto you. So the Word of God, He wants it in our minds and our hearts to create us like a new creation for Him that's going to fill the earth ultimately. Now, I can't help but think that this Gospel message is a key component to what we're talking about here, that that's part of the logos or the word, that we need to have that as well to understand this and be born again, as it were? Absolutely. I mean, it's the good news, right, of the kingdom of God. It's the gospel means the good news of the kingdom of God, which is to be established on earth, when the Lord Jesus Christ will be king mm -hmm. over all of those who basically have the same concept. 
that carry the characteristics of his father. Mm -hmm. Let's just go down to verse 9 of the following chapter. Mm -hmm. We find here that he says this is the reason he's called us out, just like Israel was called out. He says to the, the Gentiles now, or to the believers, he says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, which means separate or set apart, a peculiar people or a purchased people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, called out of darkness, again, talks about a change. That's right. So I have to be, when I'm born, I'm born into the darkness. I don't know any better. But then I got to come out of that darkness and become knowledgeable Absolutely. of that glory and that character so that I could put that on that I might bring glory and honor to God. Absolutely. And it's interesting here that it's not, it doesn't end with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ has basically shown us the character of the Father. Mm -hmm. And it goes further than that because it says here that we have been called out for a purpose. Mm -hmm. That is that we would show forth the praises, and the word actually there is virtues or characteristics of the Father, of Him who has called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. So it ties it in with the character of God, that that's the virtuous character that we're supposed to be part of. Absolutely. You let's know, go to 2 Corinthians. Let's do that. There's a wonderful passage here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that helps us tie all these things together. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we think of where we started. That we, you know, we talked about the, the purpose of God, and it, mm -hmm. was, it was this idea that He would fill the earth with a people, inhabitants, mm -hmm. who have an understanding or a knowledge, an, an intimate knowledge of His glory, which is His character. Now let's read this. Verse 6. God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give, and notice this, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So there's your whole purpose of God that we talked about back in Numbers. It was there in Habakkuk. It's now seen in the face of Jesus Christ. That light of the Lord Jesus Christ shines out to us through reading the Bible and he goes on to say that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That is truly amazing. So God does have a plan and a purpose and a reason for us to be here. And the question is, is whether or not we want to be part of it. I want to thank you very much for being here today, Jonathan Bowen, and I want to thank you for watching. This has been a wonderful time to actually think about some heavy questions. What is life? What's it all about? Why are we here? And does God have a plan and purpose? The answer is, yes, He does. And He wants us all to be part of that purpose and that glory which will fill the earth as the waters cover the seas when the kingdom is established. Stay tuned for just a few minutes. We'll be right back for some concluding thoughts. For pamphlets and articles on this subject and other Bible subjects, go to www.thisisyourbible.com, click on the Library tab, and select from Basic Bible Teaching, Bible Study, Doctrine, Life, Prophecy, The Christadelphians, in addition to our library, thisisyourbible.com offers online Bible study courses and Bible answers to your questions. Select www.thisisyourbible.com to increase your understanding of God's Word and learn about His future kingdom on the earth. Welcome back. We want to thank you for spending a few moments of your precious time with us to think about God's plan for this earth and ask you the question, what is it that you want from God in your life? What can you do to change to know better His character, His plan, and His purpose? We would encourage you to seek out, to read, and to learn more about what He has planned and in store for you. And remember that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him and that those who do so might, by His grace and mercy, have a place in His kingdom to come. We pray for God's blessing upon you all. Thank you. The Christadelphians would like to leave you with this thought. Your Bible teaches that Christ is coming and will reign on earth. Are you ready?